Right. Meantime, the former president in his first on-camera reaction to the Georgia indictment as a warning to his party. Disgraceful thing. And Republicans can't get, let them get away with it. The Republicans have to be tough. The Republicans are great in many ways, but they don't fight as hard for this stuff. And they have to get a lot tougher. And if they don't, they're not going to have much of a Republican party. Well, they haven't been very tough on Donald Trump. And one of the Republicans who is defending Trump is Vivek Ramaswamy. And today, a memo from Ron DeSantis' super PAC laid out some advice for the Florida governor ahead of next week's debate. Among the suggestions, defend Donald Trump, but, quote, take a sledgehammer to Ramaswamy. And joining me now is the candidate mentioned in that memo, Vivek Ramaswamy. He's giving a speech at the Nixon Library tonight. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Ramaswamy. Appreciate you joining us. It's good to see you, Jim. How are you? I'm good. Hey, let's get right to this. A pro-DeSantis super PAC, I'm sure you've seen this, has posted documents online that show uh, DeSantis's upcoming debate strategy. And that includes not only attacks uh, on President Biden, uh, as well as media, but instructions to, quote, hammer Ramaswamy. Are you preparing to be hammered? You know, I, I have been prepared for that for a lot of my life, and I'm prepared to take that on. The truth is I'm an outsider in this race, and I think that that is threatening a lot of the pop professional politicians, understandably. A guy like me is not supposed to be in this race, according to their book. I'm approaching my debate strategy a little bit differently. I think many times if you don't have a message, you look to attack other candidates. I'm preferring to stand for my own message, asking the question, what are we running to? And I think if we're guided by that purpose, the attacks from the other candidates are not going to stop me. And the latest Fox polling shows you've gained ground, uh, more ground uh, since June than any other candidate. Why are you gaining ground while candidates like Ron DeSantis are struggling to catch on? I think the reality is I'm unconstrained in speaking the truth. There are many forces that work in both political parties, in the establishment of the Democrat Party and the Republican Party alike, that constrains what candidates can actually say. A lot of that comes from the donor class. In the Republican Party, you have a lot of super PAC puppets. I'm not one of them. I am a patriot who speaks the truth. I am independent. I am putting my own money into this campaign precisely to avoid taking a tin can with a hat in hand, asking a bunch of donors for permission to run. And I think that's a very different model from many of the other professional politicians in this race. And the good news is voters across our country, in our base, they can tell the difference between somebody who's actually sharing their own convictions versus somebody who's parroting off talking points served up to them 15 minutes or 15 days before a debate. I think the reality is also the message of my campaign is resonating. Shut down the administrative state. Declare independence from China. Grow the economy. Revive national pride. Revive our national identity itself. We as conservatives, we can't just be complacent with criticizing the radical Biden agenda. That's boring, it's trite at a certain point in time. We have to stand for a vision of our own. And I think I'm the only candidate who's actually offering that. I think that's a big part of why we've been successful. Well, well you've got a big uh, test uh, coming up with next week's debate. And, and eight candidates, including yourself, have met the uh, donor and polling threshold uh, for that debate. Uh, you've signed the loyalty pledge. Uh, former President Donald Trump has refused to sign the pledge. Are you OK with Trump getting special treatment? Uh, shouldn't he have to play by the rules? I expect Trump to be on that debate stage later this fall, and I expect him to play by the same set of rules of everybody else. But I am fine with him missing the first couple of debates. He's been on that debate stage many times over. Heck, he was president for four years. For me, this is an opportunity to introduce myself to the country. I'm looking forward to that. Many people don't yet know who I am or don't really know certainly very well who I am. And so that's the opportunity I'm looking forward to. I do expect President Trump to show up down the line, but I think it's fair game for him to miss the first couple. What if he doesn't sign that pledge, just refuses to sign it? Does he get a pass on that? Look, I think, well, look, I think if that's a condition to make the debate stage, then I think he's going to sign that pledge to make the debate stage. But the reality is, I believe he's waiting, based on his public comments at least, it seems like he's waiting for a smaller field. So I look forward to being on that debate stage with him. But for now, I'm focused on the path to next Wednesday. I'm in eight states in the period heading up to a, between now and the debate stage. But I'm looking forward to introducing myself to the people of this country and hopefully drawing some important policy contrasts from the rest of the field. I think this is an important moment for the GOP to stop obsessing over the who. 
there's been so much obsession over Donald Trump or somebody else. Forget the who for a second. Let's first focus on who we are, but what do we stand for and why we stand for it. That's a discussion we actually haven't had in the GOP for a very long time. And I think this debate stage is actually going to be good for the evolution of our party, really defining our agenda rather than devolving into biographical brawls, even though certain other candidates say Ron DeSantis and his super PAC want him to go the direction of the biographical brawl. I prefer to go in the direction of substance, answering what we stand for and why. That's what's going to make our party stronger. Well, I think the former president is going to come up at the debate, whether he's there or not. And he's now facing his fourth criminal indictment, this time in Georgia on forgery, false statements, election fraud and racketeering charges. You have said that these are political or politicized prosecutions, uh, politicized persecutions through prosecution. Um, let, let's listen to what his former attorney general is saying about this. People who defendants say um, that he genuinely did feel that he was robbed and this was the good fight and the proper fight. Well, even if he did, right. and I am dubious about that, but even if he believed that, that doesn't mean you can use illegal means to rectify it. If you think the bank is unfairly keeping your money, there are many things you can do to get it back. You can't go and rob the bank. Yeah, what's your response to the former attorney general? Look, I think there are deep legal flaws with this case. I'm talking to you from the Nixon Presidential Library where I'm delivering a speech later tonight. We'll look at Nixon versus Fitzgerald. This is something that the press has altogether ignored. A president's acts while in office are something that he actually enjoys immunity for other than through the impeachment process. So if he believes, even incorrectly, that he was looking after election fraud, that alone could be a defense. I also think there are deep due process failures. Let's start with the fact that they actually, Fulton County, publicly posted the charges of the indictment even before the grand jury had signed them. That's a grave, prosecutorial, bushy-tailed, overexcited mistake. That's a due process violation that itself could be grounds for a motion to dismiss. We also have to look at this prosecution in the context of the fact that there are three others, now four prosecutions in a series of months, all convening around a presidential election that sets a god-awful precedent, Jim, for this country. We do not want to become a nation where the party in power uses multiple different legal cases at the same time pushing untested novel legal theories to knock out its opposition in the middle of a presidential election. That is not how we do things in the United States of America. And I say this as somebody who in many national polls is now polling second. It would be easier for me if Donald Trump were eliminated from competition. That is not how I want to win. I stand on the but side there have of been principle, four different, not politics. There are now four different when indictments. I say we need to you unite this country. Yeah, let, let me jump in. There have been four different indictments. That you, you don't think he's committed any crimes in any of these indictments? I don't think any of the indictments have demonstrated that he committed a crime. No. And I've written on the pages of The Wall Street Journal and elsewhere wearing a technical legal hat. And you and I can go into that detail if you're Refusing interested. Refusing to return but classified I think these are documents? clearly politically motivated. Well, let's just take that one as an example. That indictment made zero mention of the Presidential Records Act, the most recently passed act that relates to a president, including an outgoing president's access to documents. The fact that this is a 49-page indictment, that one was, that was silent on that fact, reveals smacks of politicization. I also think that the fact that they used the Espionage Act, one of the most un-American acts in U.S. history that has been used to round up anti-war activists, that was used to lock up Eugene V. Debs when he ran right, for president. but do you president, think it's okay to have the the classified documents? Uh, you it's think wrong. it's okay for you, you to have classified documents laying around the Ramaswamy household? No, it's not. But I think that there's a difference between a bad judgment and a crime. And the Presidential yeah. Records Act expressly well, they gives the U.S. President access to the documents back and he didn't return them. Uh, he, they asked for the documents back. Again, and I would have made very different judgments. Yeah. Look, I'll remind, I mean, Jim, I am running in the same race that Donald Trump is. So I'm not, I'm not saying that every judgment he made was the same judgment I would make. In fact, it wasn't. But that is different from charging it as a crime, which I think sets an awful precedent in our country. If you want to get a little but technical about in the federal election it, Jim, case, like he lied about the election. He tried to overturn the election results. Why not call him out for that as well? I will it, remind you. Well, I will remind you the Supreme Court's precedent in Alvarez, a 2012 case, which held that public officials, including politicians, have a First Amendment right 
to lie, to tell the truth, to even make statements they didn't believe, let alone the fact that there isn't a shred of evidence to suggest that Trump didn't even believe his own claims. And so we can get into the legal technical details all we want. That's going to happen in the courtroom. But as a matter of judgment, as somebody who is right. running to and expects to be the next president of the United States, my top job is to reunite this country. And my way of doing that is going to be to pardon Donald Trump on day one and to pardon really anybody else who was also the victim of a politically motivated persecution through prosecution. We have to move forward as a country. But, and I think this sets a Ms. dangerous precedent unless we actually pardon. But Mr. Ramaswamy, you just said you want to wait for all the details, the technical details to come out at trial. But you're declaring beforehand that you would pardon him. Why not listen for the, uh, the facts well, to come I, I out at say trial that I to, I, and then I make that <laughs> determination? I'm saying it based on one assumption. The assumption is that the statements in each of the indictments are the most prosecution favorable statements we're going to get. Any legal scholar would tell you that is a fair assumption. In any case, the prosecution always puts up its strongest foot in the indictment itself. We haven't even heard from the defense. So, yes, if there are gaping surprises that come up, I mean, there's zero evidence to suggest that Trump was selling those secrets to foreign adversaries for private gain. But if those facts come up, of course, I would revisit my judgment. But the fact of the matter is the prosecution obviously makes the most aggressive statement of its case in the indictment. And assuming that's the case here, as it is in any other case, I will absolutely pardon Trump on day one, January 20th, 2025, when I'm in office. Would you pardon Trump's other alleged co-conspirators in both the documents and the election cases? It depends on how the facts match up to the law. I mean, you know, take about the documents case. There are special features of the law that apply to a U.S. president. Literally, the Presidential Records Act treats past U.S. presidents. But why, the law why does say you would pardon Trump on day one, but not? But why, why say you're going to pardon Trump on day one, but not the, not make that kind of blanket promise to the alleged co-conspirators? Shouldn't they get that kind of uh, I'm favorably, same pardon offer? I'm favorably inclined. I, I'm favorably inclined to do it. But right now, I'm a competitor against Donald Trump in this primary, and I want to be very clear on the side of principle, though it's against my interest in this race. That's why I think in the interest of uniting this country, it is especially important to be clear about that fact. I expect to maybe making tens of pardons on day one. I think there are countless Americans who have been the victims of politically motivated persecutions through prosecution. Peaceful protesters on January 6th, January 6th defendants who actually have had constitutional due process violations. Julian Assange is someone I've specifically identified as somebody I would absolutely pardon. Ross Ulbricht, Douglas Mackey, others. But I think that the only way we're going to move forward as a country, there can be no reconciliation without truth. We have to put that past behind us. And my top job is going to be to heal the wounds of this nation to lead us forward. Because even look at pardoning, the conversation. Pardoning Trump is going to heal the news. wounds. We're, pardoning Trump is going to heal the wounds of the nation. I do. I do think it will be a step towards healing the wounds of the nation. I think there are deep wounds in this country that are the consequence of systematic censorship. The weaponization of police force to accomplish political goals through the justice system. That is wrong. This is not an easy project ahead for the next president. I am in this race because I do see a lot of candidates on both sides motivated by vengeance and grievance. I am motivated by leading this nation forward. And the way we're going to do it is by restoring one standard of the rule of law for all Americans, restore the integrity of the justice system, and leave politics to politics. The people of this country should decide who the next president is. They're free to take into account all of the information that has been laid out by left-wing media, right-wing media, etc., to make their decisions. If they what don't think Trump? Donald Trump made good decisions, then they should take that into account when voting him out. But that is what not about, the basis what about Trump? for a prosecution. What about Trump making these threats and, and making these kinds of uh, inflammatory comments about the judge, about uh, the special counsel, uh, and so on, in some of these cases? Uh, do you defend that? Should he knock that off? So uh, I'm not familiar with the specific nature of which inflammatory comment you're referring to or not. He's clearly deeply aggrieved by the fact that he's being prosecuted through four separate cases that have arisen at the same time in the middle of an election. Again, from my vantage point, I would make very different judgments and would have made very different judgments than Donald Trump. But that is a different point than saying this should be criminalized. That's where I'm at. So I'm not in this to if defend. I, he, he says I'm coming Trump after anybody you if you're else. Coming I'm in this to me. defend the nation.
But, but you've heard him say, you've heard how he said, uh, I'm coming after you if you come after me. I mean, you've heard that, correct? Is that appropriate? I mean, if he, if he means that he's going to file a motion, if he means he's going to file a motion to dismiss, then he should absolutely file a motion to dismiss, which I think will be very embarrassing for the prosecutor and, frankly, very embarrassing for the you entire don't think that that's law what he enforcement means when apparatus. He says that. If that's you, you don't, granted. But you don't think that's what I he means refer, when he says I, that. I'm going to be very honest with you. I have, I have not. You've clearly, you clearly studied every word. I, look, I'm going to be very honest with you, Jim. I have not read the specific tweet or social media post that you're referring to. I'm running for president. I'm looking at reviving our economy and declaring independence from China. I'm not parsing every social media post from every one of my other candidates. But broadly speaking, my whole point is there's a difference between a bad judgment and a crime. And the moment that we conflate a lot of crimes start two, with bad judgments. That is they? the moment that we have a threat to liberty. Yeah. What's, well, that's okay. But if we, if you actually have to have committed a crime to be prosecuted for one. So making a very bad judgment as a politician, that's a basis for a voter to make a decision. But that's how we've got to do things in the United States of America. We have to let the people of this country decide who actually runs the country, not a federal administrative police state. And I just think that sets a dangerous and deeply problematic precedent in this country. And that is why I've been so vocal against it. That is why I'm clearly committed to pardoning Donald Trump if he is convicted. But you, but you said earlier you would wait for the facts to come out. If there are some big surprises, you may, you may reconsider that. My assumption is that the worst statement of the facts, the most prosecution version, favorable version of the facts, is in the indictment. In 99.9% .9 of legal cases, that's exactly how it works in the United States. And I said that on day one when I made my commitment that that was my assumption. Let's talk about China. You, you talked about China. Um, you proposed to uh, radio host uh, Hugh Hewitt this week that the U.S. should help Taiwan uh, deter a Chinese invasion until the U.S. has achieved, quote, uh, semiconductor independence. Uh, does it really serve our long-term interest to say we support territorial integrity until a country is no, long, no longer useful to us? I think that moving from strategic ambiguity to strategic clarity is actually a good thing for the United States to both advance our interests and to avoid war, as well as to be a more trusted partner. I don't think it's credible when we make hollow proclamations to defend democracy or to defend the territorial sovereignty as a principle when, in fact, we choose that principle selectively anyway. I think it's far more credible for us to be honest, to say that I will, as the next U.S. president, I stand for advancing American interests, period. That allows other nations to actually trust us. Just as we can trust them to follow their self-interest, they can trust us to follow ours. But Move are you sending a signal that an ally... or liberal hegemony. But are you sending a signal that an allied democracy Please. could be taken over by another power just because they're no longer making something that we need? Well, let's get real, Jim. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is our current posture towards Taiwan is that the U.S. embraces the one China policy in the status quo. The standard protocol is a U.S. president isn't even supposed to pick up a phone call from the leader of Taiwan. In fact, when Trump did it, they laughed at him as though he was an outsider rube. And so the reality is that line of reasoning that somehow you're now going to call them an allied nation selectively to push back on my vision of strategic clarity is just a farce and betrays exactly what our current posture is in the first place. What I'm bringing to our foreign policy is honesty that will advance our interests. I'm moving from strategic ambiguity to be strategically very clear that we will defend Taiwan until we achieve semiconductor independence. I expect that to happen by the end of my first term, by 2028. But then China can have that, Taiwan? Is that necessarily will change. But th then well, China can to have be clear, Taiwan. After that, by being clear, not necessarily. What that really means is Taiwan, between now and then, can actually spend what it should be spending on national defense. Taiwan spends less than 2% of GDP on its military. That is shameful. Taiwan needs to be spending over 4% of its own GDP. But by being strategically clear, we give Taiwan a chance to build up its own defense capabilities. And China will also know that it is absolutely not in China's interest, not any rational actor in China would want to make that move before 2028. In the meantime, what am I going to do? Achieve semiconductor independence for our nation and also build up our own homeland defense capabilities. That's something that's badly lacking. Super EMP defenses, cyber defenses, nuclear missile defenses. But if we're at that point by 2028, along with semiconductor independent, then no, I don't expect to want to send my sons, our sons and daughters in this country to die to fight over somebody else's territorial dispute. And I think that that's exactly what 
this Chinese civil war dating back to 1949 was all about, there are two reasons why China might go after Taiwan. One is to lord over an economic gun over the United States. I refuse to let that happen. But a second is sorting out business dating back to 1949 between Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong. That's not something that I'm going to send our sons and daughters to settle. And you've also suggested that Vladimir Putin be allowed to keep parts of Ukraine as part of a, uh, as far, part of a way to solve uh, that conflict. Um, what if he wants parts of Poland You leave next? out the what most important part of that deal. More of Ukraine next. <laughs> you, you, Aren't you letting some of these authoritarian leaders off the You leave out the most important part of the deal is what hook. actually advances... Far from it. I think that the Biden administration is so stubbornly attached to the idea of getting Xi Jinping to drop Vladimir Putin. What I think we need to be doing is get Vladimir Putin to drop Xi Jinping. Just like Nixon went to China in 1972, I think Putin is like the new Mao. I will visit Moscow and I will pull Russia out of its military alliance with China. The Russia-China military alliance is the single greatest military threat that we face today hypersonic missile capabilities, nuclear capabilities in Russia, far ahead of us or China, a naval capacity in China ahead of ours, combined with an economy that we depend on for our modern way of life, those two nations are in a military alliance with one another, and nobody in either political party is talking about it. Worst of all, our engagement in Ukraine is further driving Russia into China's arms. So my foreign policy centers on weakening that alliance, that you advances let, American But you interests. would let Putin have that parts of Ukraine. That is how we actually secure peace. But you would let Putin I have would parts of Ukraine. Freeze the current lines. I, would, I would freeze the current lines of control, and that would leave parts of the Donbass region with Russia. I would also further make a commitment that NATO will not admit Ukraine to NATO. But there are even greater wins that I will that get for the United like a win States for in Putin. return. The top of the list. No, what we, our goal should not be for Putin to lose. Our goal should be for America to win. That's what we have forgotten in this country, is that driving Russia into the ground is not a U.S. strategic goal. A U.S. strategic goal is to secure peace and prosperity for Americans. And so you know what? I do think many of those military resources being used to protect against an invasion across somebody else's border halfway around the world should be used to protect against the invasion across our own southern border right here at home. And in the meantime, yes, we need to pull Russia apart from China instead of driving Russia further into China's hands. And I think we have a foreign policy establishment in both parties, frankly, Republican Party and Democratic Party alike, that behaves as though we're in still in the Cold War of the last century, forgetting that the USSR does not exist anymore and that the real threat we face today is communist China, which is that much stronger when Vladimir Putin is in Xi Jinping's camp. All right, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Jim.